like to remind you that this is a uh, taped, <clears throat> excuse me, broad and broadcast both on RCN Channel 82, Comcast Channel 8, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city-council-tv. I'd ask folks in the chamber to silence their electronic devices. At the conclusion of the departmental presentation <clears throat> and questions from my uh, colleagues, we will take public testimony. There's a sign-in sheet to my left. We ask that you check the box if you wish to testify, state your name, any affiliation, and residence. Uh, I'd like to encourage our residents to engage in this process, uh, whether it is here in the chamber or at home, to take a few minutes and uh, by giving testimony uh, for the record. And you can do this in several ways. You can come to a hearing and sign up to testify. You can uh, come to a hearing scheduled for June 5th between uh, 2 and 6 p.m which we will take uh, exclusively public testimony. You can send your testimony uh, by mail to the Committee on Ways and Means, Boston City Hall, 1 City Hall Plaza, Boston 02201, or email the committee at uh, ccc.wm at boston.gov. We are here, uh, again, as I said, with the library department as they pertain to dockets 0559 through 0563. <clears throat> Order for the FY19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements, as well as dockets 0564 and 0565, capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease agreements. <clears throat> uh, we are here in order of their arrival with my colleagues, uh, City Councilor, uh, District City Councilor Ed Flynn, City Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty, and to my immediate left, City Councilor at Large Anissa Sabi George, and uh, District City Councilor Josh Sakem is joining us as well. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to President Leonard. Thank you all for being here. I want to just say, uh, as I said, we love our libraries. You guys do a great job, and it's a tribute to you and your team. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your welcome. Um, good afternoon, members of the City Council Ways and Means Committee and other council members in attendance are joining us later. Uh, we are here today for the hearing on the City of Boston budget appropriation for the Boston Public Library as a department of the City of Boston. Uh, let me begin by introducing my colleagues here at the table and then I'd like to offer some opening remarks. Uh, to my immediate left is Ellen Donahue, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, and then Michael Colford, Director of Library Services. Uh, to my right, uh, Eamon Shelton, Director of Operations. And to my far right, Laura Ermshire, Chief of Collections. So I'm happy to report that as I near completion of my second full year in this position as President of the Boston Public Library, the library is strong. Our collections and services remain in demand across the city and state. And in particular, the most recently renovated spaces are the most used spaces as they are inviting, warm, welcoming, and dynamic and open. While the library marked 170 years last month since the charter was signed into law by this body, libraries today are about four areas of service, providing access to reading materials and literacy programs, being gathering spaces for the community with dynamic and interesting programs, providing skilled staff that offer a range of modern literacy, reference, and instruction services, <coughs> and fourth, in our special role of preserving the historical legacy of Boston, Massachusetts, the nation, and sometimes humanity itself, mostly in the form of the printed word or visual materials. Thanks for the accomplishments of the last year go to our staff, represented in the most part by the two unions at the library, ASME 1526 and the PSA. Further, uh, many, if not all, of our locations are also supported by vibrant and healthy friends groups. The library, however, is strongest when it holds all aspects of its mission in perfect balance, 
services at the central library, services at branches, services to scholars and researchers, but services to those most in need in our society as well, services online and in digital form, as well as via the printed word and in person. Collections that span the rarest of the rare to the most popular reading materials of the day. While you have a 13-page document in your packets covering a range of accomplishments for FY18 and a list of priority goals for FY19, I would like to reference some major highlights of the last year. First, the new Chinatown branch, a temporary location which opened in February of this year. And of course, the first full year of the completed, renovated, and reopened Jamaica Plain branch, which shot right to the top of the most used branch in the system. New initiatives also include the addition of a, an outreach worker um, who is a social worker funded by the Boston Public Library and the Department of Neighborhood Development. That person is an employee of Pine Street Inn, um, addressing the needs of patrons in crisis, particularly those experiencing shelter and housing challenges. With new demand and expectations, many of our internal departments would like to see increased support which is the largest driver behind our overhaul of the philanthropic and fundraising capacity for the library. The last year has been taken up with assessment and planning, and in the coming months we will, through our trustees, move from strategy to implementation, all with the goal of increasing the amount of private donations that go to support the library, um, which is supplemental to the budgets that you have in front of you today. Switching back to capital projects, uh, work is currently ongoing for the branches of Parker Hill and Dudley, as well as the next project of the Central Library, a renovation of the Rare Books Department in the Johnson Building. We have also completed a programming study at the Adams Street branch and are proceeding to the design stage. In fact, the kickoff meeting for that project's design is this evening. We are near the end of the design process for the Rosaldale branch and should be able to proceed into construction forthwith. We are continuing to do joint planning with the City's Office of Economic Development and the BPDA, Imagine Boston, uh, regarding improvements in the Upham's Corner neighborhood, which include an anchor project for a new library space. We will shortly begin a programming study for the Fields Corner branch and more minor but nonetheless substantial interior and exterior projects at Lower Mills, South Boston, South End, and West Roxbury branches, for which we have just selected as a designer, and this work will continue into next fiscal year. As we look ahead to next year's FY19 capital budget, the one currently before the Council, in addition to work in progress that I have mentioned, I would also note new or scheduled projects which include starting the design phase for the Faneuil branch, kicking off a programming study for the Eggleston Square branch, um, a roof replacement project for the Central Library, and the scheduling of site selection for a permanent home for the Chinatown location. Additionally, there is a new programming study for the South End branch, and an update to the master plan for the McKim Building in Copley Square. The five-year look ahead also includes future work for a North End programming study. Projects in other budgets which the library will benefit from include a series of energy improvements across multiple locations through a program managed by the Department of Energy, Environment and Open Spaces, park improvements which include of note the library park at the South End, and of course the Percent for Art Capital program a joint collaboration between PFD and the Arts and Culture Cabinet Office, with specific projects underway for both Jamaica Plain and Dudley in particular. Project expenditures for FY19 in the capital budget are now projected at just over $26 million, with a five-year projection now totaling $128 million, again an increase over this time last year, and we are grateful to the mayor and the senior staff uh, for that commitment to the library. Uh, these increased amounts include significant additions for the Adams Street and Rosendale branch projects to take account of recent programming and design work as well as updated cost estimates. In other areas, the library will launch its redesign uh, of a public website later this month. 
um, the first major overhaul in, in over 10 years. Our work continues on bringing our historical and special collections under intellectual control and continuing to make those collections accessible online at digitalcommonwealth.org, a statewide project of the Boston Public Library. Across the system, we offered over 12,000 individual programs with a strong focus on children and teen services, summer reading, as well as again offering specialized book lists and program offerings such as Black Is, Latino Life, and the forthcoming We Are Pride, and an especially powerful thematic organization of programming under the name of Speaking Up, Speaking Out. Pardon me for one second. Sure. <clears throat> I'm missing my last page of notes, so I will uh, take that from my phone. <clears throat> ah, that's where it went. <laughs> um, Councillor, you have great staff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and as we now turn to the operating budget before you today, what you will see is a 2.3% increase in the City of Boston allocation for the library. This is effectively a maintenance budget with two specific areas of increase, $115,000 increase to the collections budget and $118,000 increase to our IT and equipment lease purchase allocation. Additional changes at the line item level reflect some minor changes and reclassification of some expenses. These maintenance commitments and increases build on the FY18 additions in the areas of security, neighborhood services, specifically with the addition of Chinatown, collections, and facilities. We look forward to your comments and questions and hope for an ultimate vote in favor of passing this year's FY19 budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Leonard. Um, we've uh, since been joined by District City Councilor Kim Janey, as well as Council President Andrea Campbell. Um, you mentioned in your, your uh, opening remarks about an outreach worker. I, uh, first, uh, is that the only added staff? And um, B, what does the outreach worker do and how, how are they deployed? Or um, so uh, deployed? The, the addition of this person uh, was part of our overall response to uh, increased concerns over the last year or so uh, with uh, our patrons in crisis, specifically people um, who are uh, likely homeless or dealing with other, uh, other challenges. And this came about through a conversation with um, um, with the Department of Neighborhood Development, specifically the, the, uh, the, the housing and those working with, um, uh, <clears throat> with those shelter challenge throughout the city. Um, in addition, we've repurposed um, a, a vacant uh, librarian to work on health and human services issues more broadly mm -hmm. um, and continue to offer resources uh, to, to those uh, communities in need. Right. Um, and so to, your, to your question yeah. about additional staff, yeah. our uh, personnel levels are essentially um, flat from last year into this year, um, although we continue to look for uh, vacancies that, that have occurred and repurpose them um, where, where possible, uh, in many cases uh, upon completion of bargaining obligations with our, with our uh, labor colleagues. Great. Um, so the additional uh, 384,000 plus is uh, accounted for through the raises, I'm, I'm assuming then? Step increases and raises. Step, yes. step increases and raises. Uh, you meant uh, in contracted services line 52,900, uh, it's increasing by 280,000 plus. Uh, what, what are some of the services we contract out? Sure. The services we contract out are, are the larger contracts of the HVAC system and the um, security guards. Um, I would 
suggest you look at the last one, two, three, four numbers together. Mm -hmm. Some of that is less an increase. Uh, it's not as large of an increase as you would think, mm -hmm. simply because we're reallocating some costs that we had up higher in repair of buildings down to contracted services. Right. Uh, overall, that budget category is up by about 2.3 percent, and oh. some of that is simply because increases, r routine increases to HVAC, mm -hmm. uh, placeholder for increases for our security contract and that sort of thing. Okay. And, and you mentioned about uh, added money for security. What are some of the, the measures you're putting in place uh, and where, I guess? Um, so I'll ask Eamon to take that question, but this stems from uh, the current year's budget and not, not an increase in FY19. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so for the current increase in security, what we wanted to do was um, basically be able to cover the night hours at the central library when it's closed and have that uh, secured. And then we also looked at different uh, branches where we had um, um, we had a need, and so most recently we've uh, deployed security officers out at the uh, Dudley, I mean, I'm sorry, not the Dudley, the Upham's Corner branch. And uh, what we try to do is based on when we have uh, a rise in incidents or uh, issues, we, we rotate the guards in and out. We've also more recently um, allocated some of those additional hours to Mattapan where we've increased uh, security and brought in a second guard for certain hours. Uh, on, on the uh, revenue side, um, I'm looking at, um, oh, where is it here? The, especially the um, Library for the Commonwealth, um, all level funded, right? Do we continue to basically get level funded from external sources, namely state sources as so, well? So, uh, Library for the Commonwealth is level funded based upon the governor's budget, but the House Ways and Means is up this year, so by about 104,000. Okay. Um, and we are, um, as I think you know, uh, waiting to hear from the Senate, uh, hopefully later this month. Um, Rep Representative Rushing is a member of the Board of Trustees yes. of the Boston right. Public Library and continues to advocate positively for mm -hmm. uh, increases where possible. But as, as we know, some, sometimes that's successful and sometimes that's not. Right, right. And lastly, um, speaking of the board, you, we, I guess you have the ability to add uh, up to 15 board members, is that right? That, that's correct. Um, uh, the, um, all of the legislative steps required to allow us to increase the board up to um, 15 members from nine um, were completed over the course of the last year. And our board has formed a, a nominating subcommittee. Uh, its full title is um, Development, Governance, and Nominating, and is in um, close collaboration with the Mayor's Office regard to how to proceed on filling those seats. Um, a appointment uh, uh, is at the discretion of the Mayor. And do you have, it? so you have the still nine right now? We, we are currently at nine, right. and um, uh, we hope to have news in the not too distant right. future. Um, well, I, I think that's actually a, a great development uh, for reasons maybe such as development. <laughs> and uh, so I wish you success with that. And uh, let me now recognize Councillor Ed Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Siomo. Thank you, President Leonard. Um, I know we've talked several times about the uh, public library in Chinatown. It opened, as you know, February 2018. It was the first time the neighborhood has had a library in 50 years, and I believe about 10,000 people have gone there since. What's the latest on, I know it's temporary. Uh, you guys have done a great job, as, as has the mayor, in, in locating a library there. But what's the um, status of a permanent library for the, for the neighborhood? Um, so we did open in, in February. The size of the space is about 1,500 square feet. Um, most of our uh, library branches run from um, 7,000 to 20,000 square feet in total. Um, uh, the existing um, space at the China Trade Center is a three to five year lease uh, with the BPDA. Um, and uh, in the capital budget for FY19 in front of you, um, you see a project to conduct site selection for a um, for a new permanent home for, um, for the branch library in Chinatown. 
Um, there are a couple of um, sites that have been under consideration, in, including one that was um, strongly reported in the press um, as a, a development-led initiative. Um, so we are staying close to, again, to our colleagues at uh, at the BPDA to understand the viability of that location, and I know members of the community are actively in, involved in those conversations as well. Yes, that's correct. I, I'm, I'm in the neighborhood every day, and that's one of the issues they talk to me is um, the status of the library, and they want to see a, a beautiful state-of-the-art library, and I certainly support that in Cantonese and Mandarin access as well. And we're, we're very happy to see how the, the community has in fact embraced this temporary location, mm -hmm. and so um, we look forward to seeing this project move forward as, uh, uh, as, as, the, as the months come by. Thank you, and I, I've been in contact several times with the Friends of the South End Library and have been there several times talking to them. Um, they are asking for our support uh, for the allocation of $350,000 uh, to complete the second phase of the renovation of the branches downstairs interior. It does need a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an excellent library. It's a lot of people use it, people from Cathedral, people from Villa Victoria. It's very diverse. Um, is there any chance that we could get that funding for the second phase? Um, so the current status of the two projects that are now listed in the uh, capital budget with respect to the South End include the um, $132,000 allocation um, for the phase one interior uh, renovations. Um, and Eamon can give us an update on the specifics of that in a second. Um, but we have just completed designer selection and that project will, um, will kick off in the coming months. Um, additionally, there is now a $100,000 allocation for a programming study um, to plan out exactly what the um, long-term uh, best path for renovation um, of the full library should be. Uh, we, we are certainly not um, close to the idea of additional early actions, such as the phase two items, if you will, that, that you have referenced. And um, the, the Friends of the South End Library in particular are to be commended for their additional uh, local fundraising that they have done to supplement the, the numbers that we've already talked about. Um, at this point in time, um, we do not in the current capital budget um, have additional funds for those phase two activities, uh, but we remain open to the possibility of, um, of uh, advocating and asking for those uh, possibly over the course of the next year. Um, that's, that's the library's position at the moment. What's the, um, the latest on the South Boston Branch Library as it relates to the um, access to the backyard? Um, so that's one of the four projects in addition to the South End that I referenced that uh, designer selection has, has occurred for. Eamon, would you like to comment on both of those? Sure. Yeah, so um, for, for efficiency, what we've done is combine these uh, relatively smaller projects together. Uh, we're doing one procurement, so we'll have one designer on board. Um, and so, as David mentioned, we've just um, completed designer selection. They're doing site visits, and we expect um, community meetings actually in the next couple of months. Um, and, and they'll be working on, as David mentioned, South End, um, South Boston, Lower Mills. Yeah. I know South right. End and South Boston have two of the oldest libraries yeah. across, across the city. So I hope that we can put them on a plan for a, a new library sometime. I think, I think both communities deserve it. Um, then my final, my final point is, I see the, um, the workers, a lot of them are AFSCME workers, and they're dedicated, they're hardworking, very professional. Um, you know, they treat, they treat the residents with, with great respect. Uh, so I'm proud to see them every day working hard. They're living in our community as well. Um, what, is, what is the status of any outstanding issues as it relates to union negotiations or contracts? Um, so with respect to both of the library unions, both, um, both AFSCME and the PSA, uh, we're at advanced stages of uh, main table bargaining, um, and really at this point, uh, those processes need to complete before I could comment further. Thank you for taking my questions. Thank you. Councillor Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and thank you, uh, President, and your team, uh, job you've been doing over the last couple of years. It's hard to believe it's been two, but um, really from the programming perspective, and I remember 
sort of talking to you when you were going through the process uh, for the position. Uh, it's not just about the bricks and mortar. Libraries, are, I liken them a lot to our community health centers. They're sort of the lifeline uh, for, for a lot of our residents. Um, and they're sort of uniquely situated uh, within our neighborhoods. They're in the heart of our neighborhoods, and many of them are in the heart of our local business districts. So, um, uh, and the partnerships that are there have been tremendous, uh, particularly through the programming, whether it's you know, the adult literacy, the story times, the arts and crafts, uh, the baking classes, uh, bringing in guest speakers, authors, um, to hopefully inspire the next generation of, of writers. So, um, so kudos to the job that you're doing. Uh, we're lucky to have you here in Boston and as well as your team. So just wanted from the onset to let you know, I think you're doing a tremendous job. And, uh, and I see it because uh, as a citywide council, I, go to uh, a lot of the events across the city and uh, libraries are a big focal point of, of all of our neighborhoods. So, um, so keep up the great work. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, want to touch base on, <clears throat> it happens with my kids, so my uh, boys are over at PCI and they no longer have uh, the books, they have iPads. Uh, so that whole you know, hard cover, soft cover, mm. converting to iPad phenomenon. Mm. Uh, what, if any, impact is that having on your library, on spacing of your library, and particularly as you're uh, endeavoring to, to uh, to build some new ones and to renovate uh, some of our existing libraries. Yeah, I'll ask Laura Ermsher, our Chief of Collections, to talk about the, um, the physical content and e-content and what patterns we're seeing there. Uh, so it, it affects, your question goes to not just the collections but also our spaces and equipment as well. Laura. Thank you, David. So. Um can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so um, our, our digital collections continue to grow. Um, they, they far outpace any growth we have in any of our physical locations. So over the last 12 months, if you compare that to the previous 12 months, our digital collections, the circulation grew 16%. Um, and what's even more interesting is the unique users continue to grow. That's, we have over 18% more people that are coming in using the collections. And when I talk about our digital or e-content, it includes e-books and um, downloadable audiobooks and streaming video and music. Um, the, the highest category is ebooks, but a close second is downloadable audiobooks, that, and that's continuing to grow. A lot of people, as they are on the move in transit, are tending to listen to their audiobooks um, along with podcasts and other uh, digital media. So we're continuing to see demand far outpace what we have in our collections budget, mm -hmm. and the increase to our budget is going right to our digital content. Um, that was the foundation of one of our requests for the increase. We see um, year after year, as more people are learning about our collections, we have um, a harder time being able to keep up with the demand. So right now, if you um, went on to our website and requested an ebook, you'd, um, you'd have anywhere from a two to 58 day wait on what you're, what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to figure out how to manage the, the scope of what everyone is asking for so we can deliver the, um, the, the content and the collections in as fast as possible, managing how fast it's growing. Mm -hmm. I think the pattern we're seeing is that it's, it's not purely a move to digital instead of the printed or the physical, mm -hmm. but it's in addition to. Right. Um, and so uh, that's part of the challenge that, that, that Laura and her team has in terms of, of keeping that balanced. Uh, the other uh, components of the technological aspects of our services then are obviously in person. Um, for many of our population, um, the library is the place where they go to use a computer, learn how to use an iPad, get online. Uh, we certainly know today that you can't apply for a job, for housing services, for many of the civic services across the, the nation without being able to do so online. And the libraries are now the first port of call for, for many of our residents who don't have access to those resources in, in another place. And if the demand is there, then as president, don't be bashful. Everyone loves libraries, so if you have to add a zero in that column, <laughs> now's the time. Um, I, I don't so think anyone's ever called me bashful. Uh, so okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, see that we're responding to the demand. Uh, and obviously with that demand, and those are always been sort of safe space in the community, but we're in a day and age where uh, most recently not, fortunately not in our community, but somewhere up in the North Shore, you had a fatality. Um, I know uh, we've, got, uh, we've got folks trained in Narcan. We've got the safe needle disposals. Um, coinciding with uh, just our colleague, City Council Josh Sakem, just had the council passed 
uh, making registration, uh, vote, voter registration forms available. So libraries are sort of that melting pot of our communities, but uh, which raises the issue around security and safety. Uh, there are also those that use libraries to prey on children and to, to be purveyors of poison and to use technology to, to uh, you know, to sort of perpetrate, um, you know, uh, you know, their, uh, you know their, 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 their bad behavior, I guess, on others. So what are we doing in terms of, and I know we sort of have the central, which is sort of the mothership, which is over the Copley and the issues that we deal with over there, but um, individual branch libraries in our neighborhoods, um, parents need the assurances that their children, while going there after school, and we had Miss Fleming, who I saw this morning actually voting. She used to throw the Flynn kids out of the Southie Library, but you weren't the Flaherty kids out. But she was a stickler for making sure that if you're there, you're there paying attention, you're there to do your homework, you're there to learn, she's there to help you. And if someone's up there coming in to goof around or uh, to be involved in some other type of activity, you know, she threw you straight out on Broadway. Is that still happening in our local branch libraries and, uh, and do we have, are they secure facilities? Yeah, I think um, a couple of points. Uh, one, this is always a concern. Um, how do we balance um, being welcoming and free to all and making that a reality, but at the same time ensuring that both our staff and uh, where necessary uh, our contracted um, guard service are present uh, so that any uh, inappropriate behavior by patrons just isn't, isn't tolerated. And um, we recently hired um, a position that had been vacant for some time, which was a manager of system-wide security, um, who is taking a new look at um, many of the procedures and uh, processes that we have in place to ensure that they are current, they are up to date, um, that we can say with certainty um, uh, we have the right resources in place where they need to be. Um, you know, the, the notion of a library as a safe space is one that is precious to us and one that we must continue to, 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 to see maintained. Um, we have recently re-engaged with some staff groups around um, do they have the skills, are they trained on all of the procedures to ensure that they can do what in what today would be the equivalent of what Ms. Fleming did mm -hmm. in, um, in, in, in the example that you reference. Gotcha. And then just lastly, Councillor Baker had come up with a great idea a few years ago, and as you're thinking about sort of all of your sites as well as on the capital side, and again, as I referenced, you're sort of uniquely situated in the local business mm -hmm. districts and the communities, whether it's next to a municipal parking lot uh, and or uh, with small local businesses being priced out uh, or even being a partner maybe in the affordable housing crisis, just to sort of, and it just conceptually, no, you know, I guess doesn't really require an answer. It's probably more opining that just give some thought to ways that you could be sort of a creative partner or a problem solver with, you know, a, a facility that has an adjacent parking lot. Maybe we could make that a two-level parking lot, or maybe we can allow folks to use it, um, you know, at night and weekends when the library hours are not there to help with the parking crunch. Uh, maybe putting a second level on uh, for some affordable residential and or maybe a local business that could fit on the first floor, uh, maybe a coffee shop or something like that. So, um, so again, just thinking out, like, this would all, you know, with, with the development boom that we're experiencing in the city and the number of permits, um, you know, we, the city, we own a lot of, um, you know, key property that could, could play a role in all that. And we could also derive a revenue stream to help fund uh, the programming as well. So I just want us to sort of think strategically and think like a sort of a real estate uh, brain would, I guess, around our facilities. Not just you guys, it's it's our health centers, it's our community centers, it's all the property that the city owns. We should be thinking a little bit outside the box as to how we could sort of maximize that potential around parking and affordable housing and job creation and small local businesses to, again, continue the great work that uh, that libraries do for our city and our neighborhoods. We um, would call that mixed-use development, and uh, we're grateful for uh, your encouragement and Councillor Baker's encouragement on that front. Um, the most likely projects to explore that at a, a, in the near term are the Upham's Corner and the possible new Chinatown site. So we think that absolutely has a role as a model, not the model, but a model for uh, future library development. And we know that other uh, city departments are interested in further exploring that too, both with us and with the, with the community at large. So we'll, we, we will very much stay close to those ideas. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for your time and effort. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor uh, Sabi George. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you all for being here. There's actually a, um, I was interviewed for speaking to Councilor Flaherty's point about the mixed use mm. 
and future development. There was a design competition, a competition through the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, working with uh, the South Boston NDC as well as the um, library on developing some creative ideas there. So it's exciting that people are actively thinking about it and participating. Um, I am just uh, curious about a couple of questions, just follow-up questions to some stuff that's been asked already. Um, the security uh, contract for the uh, library system, that's contract, why do we use contract security as opposed to municipal police services? Um, so uh, this has been a traditional uh, approach which gives us increased flexibility. Um, in, in many cases, when we have looked at municipal protective services, uh, they would have full-time employees for every position that we would need. Uh, many of our locations need um, you know, a part-time or like a, just for a few hours during the day, all at the pretty much the same time. And so uh, there is increased flexibility that a contracted service um, gives us. And then um, there was, I know, looking through some of my notes from the last two budget hearings uh, with, with the library services, there was some training that was happening with security services as it relates to vulnerable populations. You know, we've talked a little bit about those experiencing homelessness and those in active addiction. Can you talk a little bit more about that training, how it has been rolled out to staff system-wide, and then specifically about needle pickup and disposal, because I know some staff at one point was changed, mm -hmm. trained, and I'm wondering if that's changed um, over time. Yeah, I'll ask Eamon Shelton to take that from a Great. security and facilities Thank point you. of view, and then Michael Colford can take it from a general staff training point of view as well. Sure, so um, let me just take the, the needle pickup specifically. So as, as you mentioned, uh, we had a voluntary training for our staff on Narcan, on the use of Narcan. And at that training, they were given Narcan and they, they could, um, at their discretion, uh, use it um, in, in locations. Um, and that's something we look to continue to do. Uh, more recently, as of uh, around December of last e calendar year, uh, January of this year, we've actually installed um, needle pickup um, boxes at each of our locations, at all of our uh, Sharps containers, at all of our locations in all restrooms in the Central Library. Um, we still have uh, staff trained, uh, sp specifically custodial staff trained in picking up and, and disposing of uh, needles safely. Uh, but this also gives another avenue where there's actually an outside vendor that will come in and pick up these uh, and empty these needles uh, for, for patrons to use them directly or to, to dispose of them directly. So there's a needle kiosk in each bathroom in BPL? Correct. In, in all bathrooms? In all bathrooms. Can you Correct. talk to me a little bit about the cost of maintaining that contract? Yeah, so it's it's initial, I, I, I'll have to get the figures for you after uh, the meeting today, but it's, it's an initial pilot program we've just rolled out. And basically the cost, uh, there's a, a, an upfront cost in the installation and then the cost is in the annual pickup. And so far we've had uh, sort of a limited annual pickup because it's just annual, started. Annual, monthly? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, you, it's based on the pickup. So on right now we've, uh, we initiated it as an annual pickup. Um, and we're gonna increase it as needed at the various locations. We have some locations where uh, we haven't had any pickups at all since, uh, we haven't had to empty them at all since uh, December, and then we've had a couple of locations where we've um, had to uh, clean them out more, more frequently. And then, so that started December 2017. Correct. How many locations, because you said it's a, it's a pilot? So it, it's a pilot for us because it's a new program, but we have it at all locations. Oh, so it's at all locations. So I would love to know the number of sort of restrooms or kiosks that you have, the frequency of pickup and the, um, the cost of that contract. Sure. And then is it worked at all in collaboration with the Public Health Commission or the Mobile Sharps team with the City of Boston? So we work pretty closely with them. We've been in contact with them. They're actually considering a similar program to ours, as I understand it, and have asked some, us some questions about it. Um, we still use them as a resource, um, and we still use them to empty so uh, let me just step back. 
we, the new program installed all of these Sharps containers in the public restrooms. But prior to that, we've had Sharps containers in our facilities, but in the back of house, and whereas uh, custodians or others would pick them up and dispose of them. And we work closely with the various city agencies to come and uh, replace them. Uh, now that we have them in all the public restrooms, we've moved over to a contract service. Yeah, I would be very interested because it's my intention to have pharmacies participate in needle collection, yeah. and they've balked at the great expense. And you okay. can imagine retailers balking at the great expense and the fine Boston Public Library system can do this work. Yeah. I'd say it's pharmacies. Pharmacies well, can do that while, work. While the hearing's going on, I'll see if I can pull it up. I, it's, it's, not, it's not a great expense, but I'll, I'll pull it up. We can. That, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I think Michael was going to just yep. talk about staff training more great. broadly. Sure. So for staff training, we've recently um, launched several um, initiatives. We've been providing more volunteer Narcan training for all staff system wide. We we um, have initiated some active bystander training for all staff. Um, we are bringing in conflict de-escalation training, which we've also extended to our contract security officers, so they will be um, participating in that training as well. Um, and also some youth mental health workshops um, for our uh, youth services staff. Um, we've also updated our uh, appropriate library use policy and posted that as a tool for staff to be able to um, visually let people know if they are breaking the appropriate use policy. And we are continuing to update our incident report um, process and our incident report. We, we are continuing to provide incident report training to all staff, especially new staff. We created a video so they can watch it online, but also to do in-person trainings, um, and we've improved the response time to NC, any incident report so that more um, managers are involved in receiving the incident reports and are responding faster. Great. And what's the percentage of staff that's been trained both on Narcan, on the bystander training, and then also I think on proper um, needle pickup? So the, um, I can get you the exact percentages at a certain point. Uh, the Narcan training is volunteer and um, we've been having good response to that. The um, Active bystander training we have in large groups, and um, those are all largely filled, the trainings we have scheduled. So I think we're doing a very good job, and there's a lot of interest there. And the um, conflict de-escalation trainings are a smaller group, but they have all been filled as well, so we'll be adding some of those. But you'd like numbers on all of those? Yeah. I, I'm interested yeah. just in the, the percentage of staff that's been trained. Sure, yeah, I'll get that. And then um, on the needle, on the proper yeah. needle, needle protocol numbers as well. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Zakum. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, David, team, great to see you all. I have a couple questions that uh, have been touched on a little bit already. Um, number one, on uh, the central branch uh, in Copley, and uh, Eamon, this may be best to you, but whomever, um, around security. Uh, I know you mentioned that you've added the outreach worker, which is great and has been very well received uh, in the neighborhood, so thank you for that. But, um, you know, I regularly get uh, calls, uh, emails, visits to my office hours in the neighborhood about uh, activity, particularly on uh, Blagden Street, um, you know, on the side uh, at all hours of the day, but particularly at night of um, not just loitering, but drug use, drug sales. Um, so I'm curious what the protocol is for our contracted security there um, on, you know, are they patrolling on the outside? Is this just the inside? Um, at what point are they calling um, the Boston police um, for assistance to remove people uh, on trespassing issues, uh, that sort of thing? Sure. Um, so, yeah, so we have uh, security, they're in contract of security in the building. Uh, their primary responsibility is the inside of the building, although they do patrol outside. Mm. That's less so at night. Mm. Uh, in regard to their um, collaboration or coordination with BPD, it, it's daily. Um, our contract manager has a, a great relationship with D4 police. Um, I would say we've actually worked quite a bit with them on efforts to clean up and clear up uh, some of the issues that we've been having overnight. Um, we've, I feel like we've made great progress. Mm. Um, we've had uh, a, a great reduction in people sleeping and camping out on, on the site over, mm. overnight, but to your point, uh, it's a regular issue, and now that the weather is warming up, um, we do expect to see an increase of activity. Do, do, uh, does, the, does your security um, on duty after hours? They do, but they're pri after hours we are certainly more limited and really primarily guarding the inside of the building, okay. not outside. 
So I think that's, and I don't know if that's a contract or a funding issue or whatever it is, but I certainly think, um, you know, during the day, making sure our patrons and everyone inside the library, you know, is having a safe environment is, is certainly important. But, you know, if we do have staff available, obviously the doors are locked, um, you know, walking around, um, you know, I think it would be very helpful. I, I live a few blocks away and walking through, um, you know, not just a couple nights ago, you know, I certainly don't feel unsafe, but I can see why some of my more elderly uh, neighbors um, sometimes do and why it can be an issue. So if it is feasible um, under the current contract, I, I would certainly encourage that after hours if obviously the inside, the doors are locked, um, go around. And I know, uh, and I've seen D4 um, out there a lot too, so I don't think there's necessarily casting blame, but it is it, it continues to be an ongoing problem, not just during the day. I mean, we, we have had regular meetings with Abutters and the uh, subgroup of the Back Bay Association mm -hmm with respect to um, uh, behavior generally in the, the two block area around the library. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, we have um, been advised and have relayed the message that if anyone sees any illegal activity happening, they should call 911. And um, that's, the, that's the appropriate sure. use for our abutters, for our residents, and for our own security guards to follow. Um, and I think uh, from the last two meetings I attended, uh, the, um, the attendees were happy that there had been a decrease in the number of incidents. And so the opportunity now is to com continue managing the situation as the, as the warmer weather occurs. All right. All right, thank you. And then uh, one more question, a uh, completely different subject uh, on capital uh, improvements. You know, uh, I want to talk about the Parker Hill branch um, in Mission Hill. I want to thank you all for responding, I think, so promptly and effectively when we did have a lot of neighbors concerned about the simultaneous closure of Parker Hill and Dudley, which was the next closest uh, facility, um, and particularly to the staff and the librarians at that branch who really, I think, advocated um, to keep some services going nearby and partnering with other uh, organizations in the neighborhood. And I see here that we're planning for a July reopening. Is that still uh, on schedule? Correct, it is. We haven't, we haven't announced the official date yet, but, but that's, right. that's correct. That's great. And I, I just say, I think it's um, you know, perhaps a lesson learned. I understand it's unusual for the two branches that are closest to each other to be closed at the same time. But you know, moving forward, um, if we are in situations like this again, I think it's sort of caught everyone, particularly people in the neighborhood, um, off guard, and um, again, it's probably an unusual occurrence that two such geographically close branches are going to be closed for the same period. But um, I do think uh, for staff, for patrons, um, you know, uh, we need to be proactive about that. Um, it was a little bit of a scramble this time, and I think everyone, once we realized what was going on, was more than willing to help, and it worked out. But it'd be nice uh, if we can avoid that going forward, and um, certainly appreciate. Uh, what is going on in Parker Hill? I'm looking forward to the reopening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Janey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, David. Thank you to your team. I really appreciate the, the work that you all do. Uh, for me, libraries are so important. Uh, certainly was a big part of my childhood and certainly my adulthood. But as a child, very much a safe haven. It's where I had to go every day after school was to my local uh, branch library. Um, and so the librarians and all those who staff our libraries are amazing. I'd love to just give a quick shout out to a recent retiree, Joyce Kilgo, who is a dear friend who worked at the Dudley branch. Um, certainly appreciate her service and all the folks uh, at the South End branch as well. Um, wanted to echo some of the comments and questions earlier by Councillor Flynn concerning the South End branch, so I understand that $132,000 was committed for the first phase, um, and that the Friends of the South End branch committed 50, but raised 90, mm -hmm. which needs to be commended. Um, but there's a big gap in terms of phase two. And what uh, the ask is, is $350,000 to make sure that we get uh, the renovations needed there, and I certainly support them in that ask and hope that there is an opportunity within this budget to move some things around to make sure that 
we get that. I was very encouraged this morning uh, hearing the mayor talk about our libraries at the coffee hour in the South End, talking about how you know people look at the Copley branch and then they look at all the, the neighborhoods down here, but there really shouldn't be a difference and that we want all of our libraries to be up here. And so I certainly support that and would hope that we could um, fund that request. Um, also share the comments just now about the closing of both the Dudley Library and the Library in Mission Hill and how difficult that is for uh, the community, particularly residents of Roxbury. Had some questions, just hoping that you could update us on where things are in, in Roxbury in terms of the Dudley branch with those renovations? Sure, so uh, as you know, the Dudley branch is, is closed for construction. The contractor's on board and they're in the demolition phase. Um, I've seen some pictures. We should actually, it'd be great to share them. Uh, the, the building's completely cleaned out and, and ready for a beautiful renovation. Uh, also, some of the exterior art that a lot of the community members had some concerns about has now been taken down and stored safely. Um, and we are set for a spring 2020 reopening of the Dudley Branch Library. And that's wonderful. I'm certainly looking forward to the opening. It is a, a long time from now, though. And, um, you know, want to know what plans are in place in terms of partnerships, in terms of pop-ups for services. According uh, to this fact sheet here, we know that the Dudley branch had the most Wi-Fi sessions and a lot of our seniors, a lot of residents who don't have access to internet, who don't have computers, who cannot read email without going to a library, can't print something out, were utilizing the Dudley branch library. And so I'm just wondering, was there any thought given to utilizing some of the maybe nonprofit neighbors or the bowling building, which is close by, to ensure that residents would continue to have those services that the Dudley Library provided? Um, I'd like to ask Priscilla Foley, who's here today, who's our Director of Neighborhood Services. Um, she oversees all of the branches to join us at one of the microphones and be able to respond to, to that question. I, I think th there has been um, some programming similar to the Parker Hill experience where um, staff and the friends group and indeed partners in the community have, have continued doing on a limited basis some of the service offerings. Priscilla. Good afternoon. Uh, we were actually uh, have seen an increase in computer usage at our Eggleston branch and our Grove Hall branch, which is actually already pretty, uh, uh, had a pretty high computer usage. And so we have seen uh, the shift of that to other branches. Uh, in addition, we have staff that are in the neighborhood still teaching computer classes uh, and having book talks and doing story time. So uh, using all of those uh, amazing services that are in the in the neighborhood still and staff are connecting on a weekly basis uh, with those uh, with, with those community organizations <clears throat> that's that's wonderful to hear I think anything else that we can do in terms of making sure that access to books to the internet to computer services uh, in the actual Dudley area would be helpful as well um, and happy to help you think about what that might look like offline. Um, I really appreciate that you know there was thought and consideration given because I know for so many residents in, in my neighborhood that they really count on the library to, to get access to those things. Uh, just a couple more questions um, regarding the Dudley Library. Um, if you could talk about the construction, you talked about the demolition, which I see every day, um, and the sidewalk is like completely gone, as I saw this morning, yeah. uh, workers there. I was at a recent uh, Beck hearing, and I understand this is a $14.7 million project. There were concerns raised about the diversity of the workers there, and the, also the MBE and WBE, and that um, this site, this project was not meeting the goals, and I was just hoping that there was a, a plan in place to make sure that we hit those goals. Can you yeah. speak to that? Well, uh, so the Public Facilities Department is running the construction, and so they would be responsible Wonderful. for that. Um, I know they participate in those programs and um, regularly get updates, and so I'm happy to um, gather the next update and, and then share it with you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Councilor Siomo, and uh, thank you guys for being here. And um, David, thank you and your incredible team for the hard work that you guys do. Um, I just had a, a question that's 
more probably unrelated uh, to the specifics of the budget, um, and it has to do with this preservation of books. Um, and one, how do you preserve, sort of preserve books within the library space? Um, and why I ask that is, given my new role here in the council, um, some of our awesome central staff members, some of whom were right back there uh, running this budget hearing, have asked questions about the books related to um, the council. And um, we do not have the resources to preserve those books at all. And it would be, I think, a shame um, if they were to, quote unquote, die or, or sort of fall apart. Part. Um, so I'm just curious as to what the library does in terms of preservation of its own books, those for any departments in the city, um, and what uh, appetite or, um, there might be for looking at books um, for the council. Sure. Um, Laura, would you like to talk at a general level and then we can make some specific um, offerings? Awesome. Sure. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so um, most of our, our special collections are held either at the Central Library in Copley Square or at our off-site storage facility in West Roxbury at um, the Archival Center. And so we, um, we address the preservation of the material through the climate, So and that's the driving force of our renovation to our rare books dis department. So we want to make sure that um, they're in a climate where the temperature and humidity is controlled, that it's steady, and that it's at the appropriate levels so that there's no degradation to the material. We also address it through the housing of the materials. So if it's documents, we want to make sure that they're in acid-free mm -hmm. folders, that they're in the appropriate containers that are going to protect the material from any fluctuations um, or changes. We want to um, think about light exposure, again, if depending on the type of material. Um, if it's books, we'll think about the shelving that it's on to make sure that it's, um, that it's uh, shelved in the appropriate way so it's not breaking the bindings of the books. So we look at it from first from the format of what are all of the conditions that are necessary to make sure that we're not adding to the deterioration of any materials. Um, and we also have, within the Central Library, we have a conservation lab where we, uh, we have a team that are working on the conservation of our existing collections. So there are things we've had for hundreds of years that have deteriorated over time. And so we have staff that are, are working on that, whether it's through paper conservation, through bindings, addressing any damage that has occurred and preserving it. And we also um, contract with um, outside services if it's something that's either beyond our expertise or just size and scope that's something we need to address that way. We'd be happy to consult at least on mm -hmm. what your concerns are. Um, I also, as of my role, have, uh, happen to serve on the City's Records and Archives Commission, and so there are other resources that can be brought to bear uh, depending on what your needs are and, and depending on what the records retention obligations are mm -hmm. for, the, for the items in question. Um, no, thank you. This is extremely helpful. Um, and, and lastly, um, some of these uh, books have been electronic, like they're starting to electronically upload um, some of the materials as well to preserve them that way. I'm curious as to what you do um, on your end with respect to sort of form, uh, creating digital um, forms of, of these books or your special collections. So we have um, a digitization program. So we have, um, we have staff within our within Content Discovery Department that work on the digitization of our own collections. And we also have um, a statewide program through the Library for the Commonwealth where we digitize other libraries' materials, and those are all hosted on Digital Commonwealth, which is uh, a website that is accessible freely where uh, libraries across the state have their collections available to the public, so you can search across institutions and find things. Um, depending on the copyright status, you could download things, or if it's still in copyright, you might just be able to view the things. But it's a way for our institution to promote our own works, for other libraries to um, to use the li resources through the library for the Commonwealth to um, to digitize their own collections, and then for users to be able to find things and make the connections across institutions. Um, first of all, thank you. This is very helpful. I just learned a great deal. Um, it tells you we, we I think sometimes have these budget hearings and only get a glimpse of the amazing work that you and your team teams do, so thank you, um, and thank you, Councilor Siamo. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Sabi Jewett. Thank you, Chair, and um, so I have a couple of questions now about library services as opposed to all the other work that you uh, no doubt do and I think has just demonstrated a change in times. Um, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the central library, the flagship, and the branch libraries? Because I think there's um, often sometimes a disconnect between the two. 
but we want to be able to celebrate both both um, equally. Right. Uh, we agree. Um, I'll ask Michael to talk about that because um, uh, un under Michael Colford there is a manager of the Central Library and uh, we also met Priscilla Foley a moment ago who, who manages the branches. So he's the point at which that, that comes together from a services point of view. Mm -hmm. So we try really hard, as, as you know, that every neighborhood has its own distinct flavor, has a lot of um, unique attributes. So we try in the branches to or we try across the entire system to provide a nice, consistent, high level of service that um, you can find in any location you go to, whether it's the Central Library or any branch. But at the same time, we want to make sure we are celebrating the diversity of our neighborhoods and allow the branches to have the freedom to really, um, whether it's in their collections or in their programs, um, or it's the ethnicity of their um, users. Um, but the, the managers who oversee the services that we provide are generally thinking about services system-wide. So while we have a staff in neighborhood services that oversee the staff that work in the branches, um, we have our youth services manager who is actually thinking about the delivery of youth services across the entire system, and our um, literacy services, and again, it's across the system. So we think of the services we deliver uniformly across the entire system in all locations. Um, the central library has an incredible amount of resources with regard to collections and um, some of the fancy, the lab and Team Central we have there. But it is a destination for many people for wherever they live in the city or even outside of the city. Um, we have found, particularly for teens, that Copley Square is a bit of a hub. When they're coming back from whatever neighborhood school they're attending, they often land in Back Bay Station or Copley Station before they head home to their neighborhood. So they often, we see them come in in the afternoon and use the resources we have at um, the Central Library. But when we have our meetings around services, we bring our branch staff and our central staff together so they can share their ideas and share their, um, the special resources we have at Central Library with our branch colleagues. And who determines where collections, for example, land, thinking about sort of the, the culture of each of those branch sure. libraries and their uh, community needs. I'll let Lara take that one. Um, so we, we have a bit of a hybrid system. So we have a collection development department that manages the collection system wide. And so they're ordering a lot of the materials. And then there are librarians at every location that also order materials for their location. So, and then we're in regular communication with the staff at each branch to um, talk about general trends as far as the, the subject matter, the types of material that their community is asking for, the language of the material that they might see. Um, so it's a combination of talking with the staff, hearing from the community, looking at the data of where we're seeing um, materials moving around the system. And then we also have um, some collections that aren't permanently assigned to any location, so they float from location to location. If you check it out at Adams Street and return it at West Roxbury, it'll stay there until it moves along. Um, so then we track that da the data that way to see how people are moving the collections around the system. There's also a patron request form, so um, patrons can request uh, specific items get added to the collection also. Right. And then what about program, uh, both program decision making, which would relate to its spending in each of the branches versus central? Sure. So each. Um, each branch location does have a, a budget to do their own programming, um, especially in the youth services area, but, but all across the ages. And then we have um, two positions who work out of the central library, but um, one is in charge of adult programming and the other is in charge of youth programming. And they um, work very closely with the branches to provide block programming. It saves us money and it also gives us the opportunity to bring in people at a um, whether it's authors or musicians or whatever program we're doing, and they can visit multiple locations and then it can be coordinated through our central block programming team and then um, send them out to all the individual branches. So what is the budget, uh, both for centrally for programming and then branches? Um, we have two trusts that we use to pay for most of, I'm sorry, is this on? It'll come on. It'll, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have two trusts that we use to pay for most of the training, or, excuse me, programming around the, um, at Central and at the branches. One is Hearst, uh, the Hearst Trust, and the other is the Humanities Trust. And I have to say, I can't remember um, what the distribution is 
Uh, I think our budget director is telling us $200,000 annually. Uh, it's $200,000 annually. So as I say, that's allocated both at Central and at the library, at, cent at the branches. Then we do have some... Uh, and is, it, is there a lump sum given to each branch? There is a lump own? sum given to each branch, both for programming and for programming support, so they can buy the materials that they need. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a few specific ones or, or specialty ones. For example, over the last number of years through the foundation, we've received read your way to Fenway money. Um, so the Red Sox give us those tickets and they give us um, vouchers for hot dogs and sodas. But we've also had some money to do some programming around that. As Michael said, we do youth block, block programming and that I think was $50,000 that also came through the foundation. And, and that's the, just a few examples. Is that distribution um, demonstrated at all in, in the budgeting report? So if you look budget. in the operating budget and you see trust fund income, um, that would tell you how much we expect to spend out of the trust funds. Um, we don't spend all of the distribution every year. We have uh, approximately just under 200 uh, trusts. About 80% of them are restricted. Um, is it, but that will give you an aggregate form. Is there any form. way to show though, like so in the school's budget, <laughs> for example, we get a one pager on um, the operating budget for each individual Boston Public School. Is there a one-pager operating budget for each of the libraries? There is not. We haven't budgeted that way. We could certainly provide the information that we spend there. It wouldn't show um, aggregated costs like utilities or security and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, but we could certainly show you staffing and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, the central, the, um, the way that the school's budget is, there are certain items that are centrally funded yeah. and that shows up in their budget. And then everything else goes into the the one pager. I think it's for our purposes, it's a one pager. I think it's probably a little bit longer than that. But I would imagine that each branch librarian has some autonomy and some authority over his or her budget. So there is um, both on the collection, which Laura has alluded to, mm -hmm. and on the programming, which Ellen and Michael have alluded to. That is at the discretion of the local um, the local team, uh, but the. Uh, the model that the schools uses is not a model that we have uh, used to date for um, for budgeting purposes. Right. And can you just remind me how many li how, there's central and then how many branches? Uh, 25 branches with the recent addition back of Chinatown right. since 1956. Excellent, and which we're all very excited about. And then I know that some, um, some of our branches are closed right now for renovations, which everyone's very excited about. Uh, do we have any libraries that are, that are open currently that are understaffed or have legitimate open openings, not openings that we've decided not to ever fill, but legitimate openings? Uh, there, there, are, there are always a number of vacancies in the system. Uh, which provide either a promotional opportunity mm -hmm. for existing staff or uh, may provide an opportunity for a new hire to the system. Um, I don't have that material in front of me today to tell you exactly how many there are. And we're um, generally fully staffed or understaffed? Uh, we, uh, um, so um, generally we, we run with about um, 30 or so vacancies across the system. So at any moment in time, uh, there may be some gaps in service, but we fill those through the use of floating positions um, uh, so that we, we, uh, we have minimums uh, which each location must be at in order to be open to the public. Great. And then my very last question uh, that Councilor Janey's talked a little bit about um, your handout on the use of Wi-Fi at the Dudley branch. We just generally talk about the quality of Wi-Fi and that system across the system, knowing that so many of our residents utilize the public library to access the internet. Um, so uh, the, um, the most recent uh, uh, allocation of uh, IT equipment costs is uh, specifically going to network um, upgrades. So we continue to try to keep pace uh, with uh, the demand in the community. And certainly in the last several years, we've seen people start bringing multiple devices as opposed to just wanting to use a laptop. And so it, it's really the total number of sessions active at any one time that we, we see an increase in. Um, it's something we keep an eye on. 
um, and occasionally it's more likely though at the central library where um, you know an, an area where like Bates Hall where there are a lot of people maybe during um, uh, uh, the school finals week mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of people accessing the system at one time and uh, we do have the ability to add higher density access points um, as needed and our network manager um, tries to keep up with that. And I know my colleagues um, advocated for it but I, I do know that we've uh, received and we'll hear public testimony about the desire for a greater investment in the South End branch. Um, and then there's lots of excitement around the uh, renovation at all the libraries that are having work done, but the Rosendale Library in particular. Um, I just want to, I've told my constituents that I would um, advocate for that continued support and investment. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And they told her about Faneuil as well. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Oh gosh, <laughs> Faneuil Hall. Um, and we are, we are super, uh, the Faneuil Branch Library, which I hope you'll come to the funky, what's it funky called? Funky auction. The funky auction, which is a whole lot of fun. I've been to that the last few years. And, um, you know, and for, this is my third budget now, is on the council, and um, the last two years there's been a great deal of, uh, of advocacy around the Chinatown Library, so there's a lot of happiness um, that that is underway and we're able to. This is my 11th and it's been that long that they've been advocating for the Chinatown Library, so I know it's a long time coming. And all the other libraries I forgot. Oh, all the other libraries <laughs> and the Friends groups. Uh, How many Friends groups are there? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, and then that will there, be my There's last one question. for every, um, every, branch. every branch and there is also the citywide Friends yeah. who not only uh, support some of the programs system-wide and at Central, but, but also re-grant on occasion back to some of the branch locations uh, also. Okay. Just, and just one last thing, uh, Eamon, you spoke about earlier the smaller renovations, bundling them, I think smart idea. Uh, what about the larger renovations? Is that, are they going to be picked through public facilities or are you going to be... Yeah, that's oh. correct. So, the, okay. so the larger projects will be run through uh, public facilities and, and internally. We're, we're so taking I can't on the smaller haunt you projects. Then, huh? <laughs> okay. Correct. Well, listen. Thank you uh, very much. You, you were good. good. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for your time, testimony for the panel, for the, your team members and the audience, and especially for the staff out in the field, the friends groups. Um, I think this has been, uh, you know, a wonderful growth in the library system from where we were, seems like not that long ago, and it wasn't about eight years ago when we were talking about closing branches and, and such. So uh, I wanna thank you, President Leonard and your team. Um, I'm gonna go to public testimony now. You guys can you know feel free to stay, sit back. And uh, uh, Alyssa, hi, Alyssa Cadillac. Lydia, um, with either one, that's closer. Um, Lydia Lowe and Marlene, in that order. Say, this is much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chairman Siomo, City Councilors, um, thank you for your time reviewing the FY19 Boston Public Library budget. My name is Alyssa Cadillac. I'm the president of Ask Me Local 1526, and I represent the hardworking Ask Me members at the Boston Public Library. These are the library assistants, the carpenters, the painters, the laborers, the custodians, and the clerical workers who show up every day to service the needs of the public. They're asked to help everyone who walk through our doors regardless of the situation. And they do, sometimes at risk to themselves. You heard about the needle pickup. I had one of my members who was stuck by a needle and had to go through the protocols for that. We don't ever want that to happen again. We are the face of public service in the city of Boston, and I stand here today to ask you to continue to support the work that we do. You've always shown support for the library, and we, ask, and we thank you for that. Um, it's not enough. I'll, I'll be the one to say it. We are understaffed. We do not have enough staff to staff our current facilities. And as we talk about renovations, we don't have enough staff for that either. We are still understaffed at the Jamaica Plain branch, and we're still understaffed at the East Boston branch, and I expect unless something changes in terms of budget and advocacy, we will be understaffed when we reopen Dudley, when we open Parker Hill, when we open other branches in the future. We don't have enough staff to perform basic maintenance on our buildings, never mind the renovations that are coming through public facilities. 
Last year I stated this, um, or I, I sent it in rather last year, that in 2009 and 2010 we took one of the hardest hits in the city of Austin for budget and staffing levels and we still have not recovered. So again, I ask you, ask the library, ask the mayor's office to put back in the budget more positions needed for frontline staff. Our neighborhoods deserve better. They deserve to have somebody dedicated to helping. When we put in maker spaces like we did at the JP branch, we shouldn't have to use floaters to cover that are rotating so they don't get to know the neighborhoods um, on a regular basis so that the neighborhoods come in and they can see the same people day in and day out. We are still closing branches for lunch hours, again, because we don't have enough bodies. Um, and external funding should not be used to fund these positions that are essential to core overall function of the library. They should be paid by departmental funding. If you look at the budget that's put before you, we have departmental budgets and we have external. And external are those trustees, are those um, citywide friends, are those other trust funds, the strategic partnerships I think you heard about that they'll be looking for funding. But our external funding shouldn't be used for these frontline positions. And by frontline, I mean the people you see when you first walk in the door. So I do, I ask you to go back to the mayor's office, specifically to ask for the welcome services positions, to ask that they be moved into the departmental budget. These are the people who sit at our front desks, brand new in the Johnson building. We have a brand new welcome services desk that unfortunately we cannot staff most of the time because we don't have enough people to fill it or hours in the day to cover that. And these are external positions. These are the folks who figured out we need a sign that say we speak Spanish and we speak other languages, which has significantly helped with the visitors that walk through the door to know, oh, I can just start speaking to you in Spanish and get that information that I need. We hear it all the time, and yet we can't fund that. And we forget sometimes, I think, that these positions are funded externally. Our affiliates can decide they no longer want to fund it, and that will lead to layoffs. So these people are in temporary jobs year after year. This was going, I believe, on the second year of this, where at the end of the day, if those affiliates pull that funding, they'll go back to their original positions, and somebody at the end of the day will walk out the door without a job. We can't forget that. And with today's city budget, we shouldn't even be considering that. We've had great success lately. Um, still plenty of work to do. You heard about Upham's Corner. We can't wait for a new Upham's Corner branch. We need temporary space now. The people who are working that building are doing the best that they can, but they are suffering, and the neighborhood is suffering. I also, we, had, we heard from um, Councilor Zakem and some others to not close branches that are adjacent to each other in the same neighborhoods going forward for renovation. It is a detriment to the neighborhood, and again, our neighborhood communities do not deserve that from the Boston Public Library. And just lastly, again, I ask you to look at the staffing levels for, staffing levels for the ASME members across the library. We are the people, as I said. You see them painting, you see them when you walk in the door, you see them servicing, you see them delivering the books around the system, which has increased. We need people to do those jobs and we need those positions in the departmental budget. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Lydia? That was sobering. Um, I guess we're still in the honeymoon stage. <laughs> We are really, I'm here on behalf of the Friends of the Chinatown Library, and um, you know, I'll be happy to report to the rest of our board you know, how many times the, Chinatown, the new Chinatown branch was mentioned here. Um, we are really thrilled with the new um, interim space. Um, you know, it's small, but it's, it's beautiful. Um, it's being utilized. Um, people are just you know, so happy to have library services in the community again. and. Um, you know, we're looking forward to, we hope in the future, some evening hours um, and um, really looking forward to working together with BPL on um, siting and, and happy to see the siting study in the capital budget so that we, you know, even as we are still <laughs> celebrating the new um, space that we're continuing to move the long-term vision forward. So thank you. Thank you. Molly? Hello, everyone. Um, Marlene Nienhuis of the Friends of the South End Library. And 10 or 11 years ago, I was here, and it was 
and every year since, this delegation from Chinatown asking for funding and just not getting it. I, this is where I met my co-conspirator in the library advocacy business, Don Haber, who was asking for money for the library in JP. And um, Chinatown has its library, GP, JP has its library, and the South End Library is on its way to um, a really nice renovation as well. Um, we, uh, first of all, I really want to thank the mayor and his administration for making this extraordinary commitment to the improvement of the Boston Public Library system and its branches. It is so important. It is one of the few civic spaces that are left in our neighborhoods uh, where you don't have to buy something to be there. Um, it is, and libraries are also um, places that rejuvenate neighborhoods. People want to move where libraries are. They make the neighborhoods better, more valuable. And so I really um, thank the mayor for this. I also thank our counselors for um, standing up for their libraries, uh, Councillor Janey, Councillor Flynn. I'm I know that Councillor Baker is in full support of what we're doing as well. So in the last, and I want to thank as well um, um, David Leonard and his team. In the last year or two, we have been talking about how to get the South End branch renovated. It is cramped. It has a very difficult population with um, mental health and addiction and other issues that are especially difficult in such a cramped space. We have an urgent situation, which we expressed to, the, to David and his team and to the mayor and to our counselors, and they have responded. And basically, um, um, we formed a public-private partnership for the first time in Boston uh, to raise capital money to phase in a renovation without pushing aside other already planned projects that were also uh, very much needed in the other neighborhoods. So um, the first phase, um, as you may have heard, was for um, there was an allocation uh, in, in the previous fiscal year of $132,000. We pledged to raise 50, and we raised 90, and apparently still some money is coming in. What this shows is that there is an extraordinary um, commitment and ability to pay privately for a great resource in the neighborhood, such as a library. The second phase of our two-phase renovation for the interior is a more expensive one. The total project of the two phases would be is estimated to be at about six hundred fifty thousand dollars. The hundred eighty-two thousand dollars that for the first phase is on its way. What we need is um, three hundred fifty dollars from the city in the budget. It doesn't have to be the FY19, it can be the FY20 and 21. The reason why is that we want to continue raising money privately, this time from the business community. That is, I can guarantee you, ready to assist in this. Um, we want to raise $100,000 from them to uh, complete this renovation. And the reason why the first phase uh, fundraising was so successful is that first of all, we had a public-private partnership with an honorary fundraising committee that included um, David Leonard and our counselors and a number of realtors um, and community um, icons, really. Um, and this is what we need to for the second phase. When um, the next donors coming up are uh, going to look at our proposal, they need to see that there is a public commitment. And this is what we would like you to insert the additional $350,000 um, into the budget for. So, um, I can talk endlessly about libraries and how excited I am about what is happening in uh, the South End. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer it. 
Thank you. Okay. And I want to join you in thanking the mayor and the president for their commitment, especially to the capital improvements. And it's almost a doubling of last year's capital expenditure. And as I think you said, over the next five years, it's over 125 million in capital improvements throughout the system. So there is a commitment from all of us to uh, continue to fund our libraries and make them the safe, welcoming spaces that, that we've grown to uh, get be used to. So thank you. Thank you. Um, unless anybody else, everybody's good? Thank you. Again, thank you, David, your team, staff out in the field, especially the Honan, Faneuil, and uh, Brighton Library staff. And uh, this hearing is adjourned.